Hi, my name is Mary Sims. I just graduated from the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, and I'm about to begin my freshman year at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I'm going to present to you today about my findings that SMARCA2 downregulates UCP1 expression in adipose tissue. So here's a map of the prevalence of obesity amongst US adults in 1985. As you can see, there's not much data collected um, in the data that has been collected is shows that there's n the prevalence of obesity is very low in most states it's less than 10 percent or from between 10 and 14 percent in many states but as time progressed this changed as the blue is getting darker and as it's becoming more red we're seeing that the prevalence of obesity is increasing until 2010 when one out of three americans were obese and that's how it is now also so the question is how do we decrease the prevalence of obesity well, understanding how we can do this requires an understanding of metabolism, which is this balance of energy intake and energy expenditure. So obesity develops whenever energy intake exceeds energy expenditure. So basically, this excess energy needs to be stored in adip needs to be stored. So it's stored in adipocytes, which make up adipose tissue in addition to this extracellular matrix. So as energy is being stored, the adipocytes grow and get larger, and they begin to press against this extracellular matrix, causing stress, which often result in metabolic diseases, inflammation, insulin sensitivity, and sometimes diabetes that are very characteristic of obesity. So um, interestingly about this is that different humans and animals have different levels of energy expenditure. So basically this is seen whenever you see two humans eat the same amount of food, but one becomes obese and one stays at a normal healthy weight because they have different levels of energy expenditure. So the question is what is causing this variation in energy expenditure? Well, one answer to this is the uncoupling protein 1, also known as UCP1. Numerous studies on, um, have shown that UCP1 induction leads to increased weight loss because it increases energy expenditure. But also with UCP1, different humans and animals have different expressions of UCP1. So basically this allows us to modify the question, uh, what is causing these different levels of UCP1 expression? So an important thing to note is that different adipocytes have different functions. So there, traditionally it was known that there were brown adipocytes that were found in brown adipose tissue, and they burned fat because they expressed this gene UCB1 that encoded for uncoupling protein 1. And then there were white adipocytes that were found in white adipose tissue, and they stored fat and they couldn't burn it because they did not express this UCP1. And that was basically as simple as it was. But then recently, people have found UCP1 expression in white adipose tissue. So basically, this is suggesting that there's this new type of cell. Like, they determined that these cells that they found could not be white adipocytes because white adipocytes are defined as adipocytes that don't express UCP1 expression. So they define this new type of cell called beige adipocytes. So the main difference between beige and brown adipocytes is that brown adipocytes have not been found in adult humans because they typically decrease in number as humans age. But beige adipocytes have. So basically this suggests that beige adipocytes are the best places to look for variable UCP1 expression because you can relate whatever you find within them to adult humans. So this helped us determine our goal to determine what is causing the varying UCP1 expression in white adipose tissue. So, the f so to look into this, we wanted to look at a model of the human condition. So we looked at 519 mice from an F2 intercross between the BTBR and C57 BL6 strains. These are chosen by the Allen Addy Lab to look at because they both have different reactions to the fact that they don't produce leptin. So basically, they'd eat and eat and eat, but some would become obese and some wouldn't. And this models what happens in humans. So the first step in looking into this was to make sure that there was variation in the UCP1 expression within, the, within these mice. So we looked at a genome scan plotting, looking at UCP1 expression, and we found that there's a big peak on chromosome 8, which is where the UCP1 gene is actually located. So basically this is saying that at this sp specific genetic locus, there is a lot of variation in UCP1 expression. So we wanted to further look into this genetic locus, so we looked at an effect plot. And we found that mice with the BB genotype, which meant that they are homozygous with B6 alleles, 
had significantly lower USP1 expression than mice that were homozygous with BTBR alleles. So basically, I was saying that there's a lot of variation just between the two different strains with USP1 expression. So that meant that it was a good model to look at. Uh, also, it said that something is causing variation in USP1 expression that could have an eff that could have an effect on energy expenditure. So it's worth looking into. So the next step was to look back at the genome scans of USP1 expression and remove that peak on chromosome 8. So we could look for other peaks that have a significant effect on USP1 expression. And we found that there are four genetic loci that have significant effects. And these are on chromosome 4, 16, 17, and 19. So to look into these, we filtered through 16,677 gene expression traits that we had collected from these mice. And to do this, we first filtered out all the traits that were significantly correlated with UCP1 expression. And then we took this pool of traits and filtered out the ones that were significantly associated with the four genetic loci that we had determined as significant. <coughs> this created four pools of genes. And then we filtered out all the traits that were statistically upstream to UCB1 or likely to be upstream to UCB1 relative to the defined Bayesian information criterion um, conditions that we had set. And this reduced the size of the pools of genes. And then we filtered all the genes on the specific chromosomes we were looking at. Uh, we got all of these genes. Then we further filtered them by by selecting the ones that were actually underneath the peaks that we saw in the UCP1 genome scans, and that reduced them down to a total of three gene expression traits. And then we wanted to reduce them further, so we looked at the conditional genome scans, and we found that whenever you, that conditioning UCP1 against marker 2 expression significantly increases the peak on chromosome 19. So basically suggesting this relationship that SMARCA2 downregulates UCP1 and that the chromosome 19 genetic locates uh, affects the expression of both of them, which makes sense because SMARCA2 is located on chromosome 19. So the next conditional scan, basically whenever you condition SMARCA2 expression against UCP1 expression, you see a big peak on chromosome 8 emerge, also saying that SMARCA2 expression down regulates UCP1 expression and that the chromosome 8 QTL uh, is upstream to UCP1 expression, which makes sense because UCP1 is located on chromosome 8. So basically all of these were saying that SMARCA2 down regulates UCP1 expression in white adipose tissue. So to further look into this, we wanted to connect it to a clinical phenotype. So we looked through all the clinical phenotypes we had measured, and we found that the most significantly correlated trait to UCP1 expression was the measurement of blood triglyceride levels measured at 10 weeks of age. Um, and we found that it's negatively correlated with UCP1 expression and positively correlated with SMARCA2 expression. S and this made sense with what with what we knew biologically, because there's this um, triglycerides and USP1 expression regulate the, one another. So to further look into this, we wanted to look at the interactions between SMARCA2, USP1, and triglycerides using um, this statistical model called QTLNet. And we found that SMARCA2 is upstream to USP1 and triglyceride levels, and USP1 is upstream to triglyceride levels. And again, this worked into what we knew because SMARCA2 expression decreases the amount of fatty acids, which decrease the amount of triglycerides that can be stored in adipose sites. So, and this also worked into what we, the previous known information, that SMARCA2 is upstream to USP1. Um, and we just added in triglycerides into the mix. So, the results from QTLNet in addition to the fact that SMARCA2 was the only gene out of 16,000 genes that passed through the specific filtering method. Um, and the fact that both of the conditional scans were saying that SMARCA2 downregulates USP1, and the fact that SMARCA2 expression and USP1 expression in, adipose, in white adipose tissue are negatively correlated to each other all say, all let us conclude that SMARCA2 downregulates USP1 expression in white adipose tissue.
So basically, this suggests that potentially knocking out SMARCA2 could increase the amount of used to be one expression in white adipose tissue and therefore increase the amount of beige adipocytes and ultimately increase the amount of energy expenditure. So this helped us come up with the question, will knocking out SMARCA2 ex affect USP1 expression in an in vivo study? Well, currently, in vivo studies have not been performed on this, but my data is saying yes, and it indeed will. So next step is definitely to take this into um, just like in vivo studies and confirm what I've found in those types of studies. So knocking out SMARCA2 could lead to a better understanding of obesity because it could potentially lead to clinical trials and drug therapies that could maybe decrease the prevalence of obesity, which would be great. So that's it. So I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Gary Churchill and Susan McClatchy for their mentorship as part of the summer student program at the Jackson Laboratory this summer. And additionally, I'd like to acknowledge the members of the Churchill group for just welcoming me into the lab and making it feel like home. And I'd also like to thank the Jackson Laboratory Summer Student Program donors and coordinators for just making the program awesome. And then finally, I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for funding me to be here.